dear friends, welcome. Welcome once again to Refill 100. Today's program is about meritocracy. And we start as follows. It is claimed that one of the most famous remarks uttered by the famous physicist Isaac Newton was this. If I have seen a little further than it is by standing on the shoulders of guidance. And most people tend to believe that Newton meant that his scientific achievements were built on the discoveries of his predecessors. In a meritocratic society, however, members and defenders of the meritocratic perspectives think differently. If you, as an individual, work hard and put serious efforts into your projects, then all the reward all the fame and all the wealth that you achieve is yours and only yours. For indeed, in such a society, it is believed that everybody gets what they deserve. It is common knowledge that in an aristocratic society, income and wealth are determined to a large extent by being born into an aristocratic, wealthy family. And if everything works as planned, income and wealth will pass down from the current generation to the next one. The point then is clear. Individuals born to noble families are and will remain wealthy. And individuals born to peasant or poor families are and will stay poor. But in a meritocratic society, if you work hard, if you work hard enough and you have enough talent, then you deserve a higher income. And the accumulation of wealth is fair and is to be seen as normal. And yet, one could ask, are things that simple? True, a meritocratic society enables people to improve their condition and exercise their talent and ingenuity. However, it is also the case that a meritocratic society does not and cannot take inequality away. In fact, the opposite occurs, namely the gap between the rich and the poor, between the talented and the less gifted increases. Opposing the meritocratic perspectives, philosopher Michael Sandel points out that those at the top are at the top not because they are the best. Rather, they are at the top because they have benefited from a favorable 
starting point. Either they had loving, supporting, and possibly affluent families, or they went to good schools and had dedicated teachers. On the other hand, those who are now at the bottom never had such opportunities. Rather, they come from disintegrated or poor families, did not have access to a decent primary or secondary education, and generally didn't have access to higher education. At this point, hence, one could wonder whether there is a way to make sure that all children, regardless of family, background, have the educational and cultural opportunities to reach their full potential. In other words, can a meritocratic society truly create equal opportunities for everyone? The simple and direct response is no. A meritocratic society can't make an equal offer to all its members. Asandel also highlights, at the end of the day, the meritocratic ideal is flawed because it ignores the moral arbitrariness of talent and inflates the moral significance of effort. Now, in places where people from different social and cultural backgrounds interact, things get complicated because individuals care not only about how much money they have, but also about what their wealth or poverty signifies for their social standing, for their health, and for their self-esteem. And yes, while meritocratic success brings a sense of achievement for having earned the place where you are at, it also has a counter effect. Being poor in a meritocratic society, in a meritocracy, is demoralizing and humiliating. And why? Well, because individuals are led to believe that they are where they are at because of their laziness or lack of commitment and discipline. And so, is anyone interested in being called or seen as a lazy person or as a loser? I don't think so. Sandel points out that if one is aware of the moral arbitrariness of one place in society, then one also realizes that what one has in life is not really deserved. This also leads to understand that allocating job and opportunities according to merit does not reduce inequality. This is so because by aligning inequality to ability, people get the impression that they get what they deserve and thereby they justify the gap between the rich and the poor, the successful and the not successful, and the feelings of their being superior to other increases. But even if we were all equal, 
meritocratic people tend to think that they are important and indispensable, that they are superior to others, and that they deserve more. After all, their co-workers or co-citizens are a step down on the ladder of success. However, by projecting these views, the meritocratic elites have been gaining the resentment of those who, despite their effort and, and their hard work, fail to rise. In fact, this resentment is what is causing the political, populist, and fundamentalist revolts of recent years in the USA and in other countries of the Latin American continent. For indeed, it is the promise of equal opportunity what gives the aspirational classes a reason to take part in the debates about success to jobs, education, and public office. Accordingly, when people complain about meritocracy, the complaint is about the failure to live up to it, as Sandel observes. At that point, they have realized that the wealthy and powerful have rigged the system to perpetuate their privileges. But then, what is the real problem of meritocracy? Sandal suggests that deep inside, a competitive meritocracy is a hollow political project that reflects an impoverished conception of citizenship and freedom. Helping people to climb up the ladder of success does not solve the social, political, economic, and inequality problem that Western societies are facing today. As a moral and political project, Sandel also says, meritocracy is unacceptable because even in a fully realized meritocracy in which jobs and pay perfectly reflected people's efforts and talents, it doesn't help to construct a just, fair society. Further, even if meritocracy were fair, it would not produce a good society because it generates arrogance and anxiety among the winners and humiliation and resentment among the losers. This is why most contemporary philosophers reject the notion that society should allocate jobs and pay based on what people deserve. Meritocracy can't offer equal opportunities to everybody because families can't offer equal opportunities to their children. Affluent families will always help their children more than poor families can do to help theirs. Besides, the meritocratic ideal is about, it's all about climbing up, about mobility, about escalating, not about equality, not about social esteem. And yes, while meritocratic success brings a sense of achievement for having 
earn the place where you are at, it also has a counter effect. Being poor in a meritocratic society is demoralizing and humiliating. Meritocratic societies then are not about social justice of the redistribution of wealth. And so rather than being a remedy for inequality, the meritocratic ideal is a justification for the inequality that we all see in today's world. By way of conclusion, by way of conclusion, what one could point out that much of the appeal of the meritocratic faith consists in the idea that our success is our own doing. However, if we listen to Newton, we would come to recognize that our talents and success are not our own doing. And such recognition would destroy the picture of our own self-making and worthiness. If our talents are gifts for which we are indebted, and if the rest, and if we rest on the shoulders of others to reach success, then it is a mistake and a conceit to assume that we alone deserve all the benefits that we eventually achieve. That we have this or that talent is not our personal doing, but a matter of luck. And if we do not merit or deserve the benefits that derive from luck, then our understanding should be different. But of course, we could also ask, does effort make us worthy? And of course, the defenders of meritocracy would have to respond with a sound yes. Those who rise by their effort and hard work are responsible for their success and worthy of praise for their industriousness. However, one must also recognize that success rarely comes from hard work alone. Effort is not everything. In the final analysis, success is a combination of talent, effort, and help that we receive from others. And if we are not able to recognize that, we end up in self-idolatry and self-indulgence. Further, if we are incapable of accepting that, then we end up contributing to the destruction of peace goodness, human solidarity, and the common good. Dear friends, this is all for today. Thank you so much for your attention. As always, we ask you to subscribe to Repeal 100 so that uh, we can continue having these conversations with you. All the best. See you next time.